So chapter 51 is all about animal behavior. Um, the picture you just saw was a fiddler crab. They have both a small claw and a large claw. They use their small one for feeding and their large one for waving. Um, the waving is used to attract females and repel other males. Um, behaviors are the way your system, nervous system responds to a stimulus. It can be carried out by hormonally or through the muscular system, um, what and how it's able to do it. Um, these behaviors are subject to natural selection. They are influenced um, by innate factors as well as learned factors. And optimal behaviors help to maximize an individual's fitness. So Tenbergen identified four questions that, could, that should be asked about an animal's behavior. One and two are going to go together. Three and four are going to go together. What stimulus is eliciting the behavior? And what physiological mechanisms mediate that response? So what is it and how does it work? How does the animal's experience during growth and development influence the response? So what other factors are going to impact on the response we see? Um, how does the behavior aid survival and reproduction? So long-term, what is its impact? And then what is the behavior's evolutionary history? Um, the th question three is looking at long-term more immediately. Question four is kind of looking back in time. So behavioral ecology is looking at the study of both the ecological and evolutionary basis for animal behavior. Um, it's going to integrate both the proximate and ultimate explanations. Proximate causation is the how part. How is it modified? So that would be basically um, working with Tinbergen's questions for the first two. And then ultimate causation, why is it happening the way it does? And especially in the context of natural selection, would address questions three and four. And the idea is that animals are going to increase their fitness um, with optimal behaviors. So one example of this is fish breeding. They breed in the spring. Um, why they would do this in terms of approximate cause would be because of the day length. The ultimate cause would be that breeding is going to be more successful um, when the temperature is optimal and food is available. Um, ethology is a science that looks at animals in their natural environments. Fixed action pattern is basically a sequence of unlearned behaviors, innate behaviors that are unchangeable. And once they get initiated, they're going to be carried through most of the time to completion. Um, they are typically triggered by some sort of external cue. There could be a single cue or multiple cues, a sign stimulus. Um, Tenbergen saw male stickleback fish respond to red trucks um, because the red underside is um, the of an intruder is a stimulus for this particular fish for attack behavior. And as long as there was some red present in very unrealistic models, that same behavior was observed. And so that's kind of a picture of what you're looking at, that the male stickleback fish fish is using as a stimulus and that it behaved the same way regardless of whether it was a realistic stimulus or not. Migration. It's also thought that environmental cues will help to trigger movement in one direction. Migration is long, regular long distance change in location. How are animals able to do this? They orient based on the sun's position, also their circadian clock. Uh, we talked about that a little bit with the nervous system, the North Star's position, and the magnetic field of the earth. Behavioral rhythms um, are impacted in part um, by circadian rhythm, the rest and activity cycles we go through daily. Um, the migration and reproduction behaviors um, are linked to seasons changing or circannual rhythm. Um, daylight and darkness can play a role. And then there's also the thought that lunar cycles may be um, impacting as well but, um, due to tidal movements. So in behavioral ecology, a signal is some sort of behavior that would cause a change in that particular animal's behavior. Communication is the way these signals are transmitted and received. Um, they can receive um, signals or be communicated through um, various um, sensory um, processes such as visual, chemical, tactile, auditory. And then the fruit fly courtship will follow a three-step stimulus response chain. First, the male identifies a female. He smells that female's chemicals in the air, so then he's going to orient visually towards the female. The male lets the female know he's there by tapping the female with a foreleg and then confirming that it is truly a female. 
The male will produce a courtship song to inform the female that he is male. So auditory communication extends, vibrates his wings. And if all three steps are successful, the female will allow the male to copulate. So there you go with the different steps. Honeybee communication. Honeybees actually have pretty complex communication with symbolic language. When a bee returns from the field, he'll, um, he or she will perform a dance to communicate information about the distance and direction of a particular food source. So there you can see that the bee has found um, food sources at A, B, and C, and because of those different locations, um, when you have that round dance, the food is nearby, and you can see different roundings depending on where its location is. And then a waggle dance is that the food is far away. Pheromones. Talked a little bit about chemical signals. Animals can communicate through odors emitted, emitted um, through pheromones. Chemical substances, you don't need a lot of them. Um, they can be pretty effective at lower concentrations. Some examples, a female moth can attract a male moth many kilometers away. Honeybee queen produces a pheromone that will affect the development and behavior of both the female workers and the male drones. When a minnow or catfish is injured, an alarm substance in the fish's skin will disperse. Um, that initiates a fright response among fish that are surrounding that one. And nocturnal animals um, tend to depend more on their olfactory and auditory, auditory communication skills. Um, that would be most of your terrestrial animals. And diurnal animals like us and birds will use both visual and auditory communication. So there's the minnows before the alarm, and now there's the minnows after the alarm. Innate behavior is developmentally fixed. It does not change among individuals. Um, Cross-fostering studies take the young from one species and place them in care of adults that are from another species. Um, and this kind of gives you a better idea of how environment is influencing that animal's behavior. Um, so they study some California mice and white-footed mice, and they determined that there was an influence on social environment based on both parental behaviors and aggressive behaviors. Um, that the cross-fostered mice um, tended to develop behaviors that were consistent with their foster parents. Um, we can also look at this in some regards. Obviously, you have to consider um, the impact it would have um, on, human on humans, but you could do this with twin studies. Learning and imprinting. Learning is behavior being modified through specific experiences. Imprinting is going to involve both learning and have innate components. It is typically not reversible. Um, there is a sensitive period which separates imprinting from other learning where only certain behaviors are learned. So one example of this is with geese. Conrad Lorenz um, had baby geese follow him um, for the first few hours of their life. And when they did that, they imprinted on him as their parent. So the imprint stimulus is basically just some sort of object that is moving away from the geese, but was nearby them to start with. Um, the conservation biologists have been able to use um, imprinting to help um, save whooping cranes from extinction. Pretty wild. Spatial learning, more complex modification of behavior is based on how you experience um, the spatial structure of your environment. Um, digger wasps um, were able to be used to show, um, to, we were able to use digger wasps to see um, how we could find nest entrances um, by seeing what they use as their landmarks. Cognitive map basically is how internally you see those spatial relationships between objects um, in your surroundings. So nutcrackers were able to find hidden caches of food that were located between certain landmarks. Associative learning. Animals are able to associate one stimuli in their environment with something else. So this particular mouse, white-footed mouse, would not eat caterpillars that have certain colors because it had a bad experience eating a monarch butterfly caterpillar. Classical conditioning is when you associate some sort of stimulus with a reward or punishment. Um, so when people train dogs, often they'll do bells. Um, that, that's kind of an indication of something that's going to take place. In this particular example, a dog that repeatedly hears a bell before being fed 
will, if they hear the bell, will get excited. They'll start to salivate because they think they're getting fed again. Operant conditioning is when the behavior is associated with a reward or punishment as opposed to the stimuli. Um, trial and error. Um, a rat that gets fed after pushing a lever will learn that they have to push that lever to get food. Um, and if a predator has had a painful experience with a prey, it'll avoid that particular prey. Cognition. Um, process of knowing that includes being aware, your reasoning, your recollecting, and your judgment. Um, being able to distinguish same from different with honeybees. Problem solving. Coming up with some sort of strategy to overcome whatever obstacle is in place. So if chimpanzees want food, they might find a way to stack boxes in order to get that food. Um, ravens might get food that's suspended from a string on a branch by pulling up the string. So you could look at it with um, particular colors or patterns, or different ways that you could go about doing problem solving. Learned behaviors, they occur typically in some distinct stages. So a white crowned sparrow memorizes its species song early on in its life, and then it learns to sing the song in a second point. Social learning, observing others, forming culture roots. Young chimpanzees learn to crack palm nuts with stones by watching older chimpanzees and then copying them. Vervet monkeys will give and respond to distinct alarm calls um, for different predators. So culture is when information is transferred by observation or by teaching that's going to influence individuals throughout that population, and it can both alter behavior and influence fitness. So behaviors can enhance survival and they can enhance your reproductive success. Natural selection is able to refine those behaviors um, to incur, uh, make feeding more efficient. Foraging, which is food obtaining behavior, is identifying, searching for, capturing, and eating such food items. In Drosophila melangaster, there's a gene that dictates foraging behavior in its larvae. Um, one allele, um, larvae with one allele are able to travel further for foraging than others. If they are in high density populations, it's more beneficial to have that allele. If you're in a low density population, you don't necessarily need it. So depending on the population's density, natural selection will favor those different alleles. So evolutionary changes were observed over several generations in part because of population differences. All right, skip one. Um, foraging behavior basically is a compromise between your nutritional needs and the cost energy as well that's going to be involved in obtaining that food. Um, you don't want to use all your energy up to go get your food, to travel back, then just to have to go back and get food again. So you have to account for what energy costs are going to be involved in getting that food and also what energy costs might be involved with fight or flight if you might perhaps be attacked or eaten while foraging. So natural selection wants to minimize those costs and maximize those benefits um, to obtain the foraging behavior that's gonna be most conducive for that species. So optimal foraging behavior was demonstrated here by the Northwestern crow. It would drop a whelk, which is a shell that's got uh, from a certain height to break the shell so then it can eat um, the organism inside. Um, it has to decide how high it wants to drop the shell and how many times it's going to have to drop it because each of those is going to require more energy. Um, so there's a graph showing the different drop heights and showing the total flight height after counting the number of times you had to drop it. And so what was determined to be the optimal height for the crows was 5.23 meters. And you can see that that required... Um, for the average number of drops, that one required less than 10. It looks like seven or eight. So again, balancing risks, balancing disadvantages versus advantages. Um, predation is going to play a role in how your foraging behavior is going to come about. Mule deer are going to feed more in open forested areas because they are less likely to encounter mountain lions and be attacked. Mating behavior um, can also play a role. Uh, mating behavior is going to involve seeking, identifying mates, choosing among mates, um, competing for them, and then caring for their offspring. Um, and this de defines a lot of different mating systems. Mate choice, we're going to talk about some, the monogamous, the polygonous, the polyandrous, 
um, on the next couple of slides. Um, mating relationships between males and females will vary greatly depending on your species. Um, a lot of species you have promiscuous mating, so there's no um, super strong pair bonds or lasting relationships that develop. Um, monogamous relationships, you have one male that mates with one female. Um, they tend to look fairly similar to one another, have external morphologies. If you're in a polygamous relationship, you will have an individual of one sex that will mate with several individuals of another sex. Um, they usually are sexually dimorphic. They have different external morphologies. Um, the polygamous relationships can be polygonous or polyandrous. In polygony, you have one male that meets with lots of females. Um, the males tend to be more showy and more larger. In polyandry, you have one female that mates with many males. The females are the ones that are more showy. So what the young needs, again, the survival is really important, is going to play a, a critical role in constraining what type of evolution takes place within a mating system. So if you've got a bird species where chicks need to have continuous food, the male is going to maximize that reprodu his reproductive sex by staying around for the mate and helping to care for those chicks to ensure their survival, monogamy. Um, there are bird species where the chicks are able to take care of themselves fairly quickly afterwards. So polygony would be um, a better fit for that male um, because then he can seek out additional mates and produce more chicks that would overall increase the number of offspring he is able to reproduce. So mating systems, parental care, certainty of parent paternity will influence this. Um, we don't always know who the father is. Females do know um, that the eggs that were laid or the young that were born had their genes, but the paternal um, characteristics or the paternal nature of those offspring will depend on mating behavior. Um, it is paternal certainty is fairly low in species with internal fertilization because the mating and birth processes are separated over a period of time. It's a lot higher when both egg laying and mating occur at the same time in external fertilization. Um, you know pretty much right then and there who the father's going to be. So when you have external fertilization, parental care is going to take place not just with females, but also with males more likely. So sexual dimorphism results from sexual selection. We talked about that back with natural selection. In intersexual selection, you have members of one sex that choose mates um, based on traits that are present. Intrasexual selection will have competition occurring within members of the same sex for mates. So female choice would be a type of intersexual competition. They can drive the selection process by choosing males that have certain behaviors or certain anatomical features. Female stalk-eyed flies will pick males that have long eye stalks or ornaments. Um, they tend to connect with that particular male's health and vitality. Another example would be with zebra finches. Female chicks that imprint on ornamented fathers are going to be more likely to um, select ornamented ma mates um, in the future for their offspring. So that has played a role in ornamentation be being um, a more desired trait in these male zebra frenches over time. So there you've got both parents ornamented and you've got your offspring that have been generated. Then you've got two males that are ornamented. And so the, pre uh, the mate preference of the females was both um, an ornamented male in this control group, you have females that are ornamented and the preference for the female offspring, it didn't really matter. But in the parents that weren't ornamented, it, um, there was no preference for ornamentation. So whether it was, um, it was the male that pretty much determined um, whether you were gonna, the offspring was going to prefer an ornamented male or not. Mate choice copying. Um, you individuals are going to copy others' mate choices. So here we have guppies. Um, female model choice influence the choice of other females. So you've got your control sample, male guppies that have different colorations. And it says here in the control sample, the female guppy preferred males that had more 
orange coloration. With the experimental sample, we've got a female that is in a relationship with a less um, colored orange male. And so as a result, other female guppies preferred that less colored orange male. Um, male competition for mates. Um, this is a source of intra-sexual selection that can reduce um, male variation, um, agnostic behavior, some sort of ritualized contest that determines which competitor wins, which one gains access to that desired resource. Game theory. Sexual selection has um, played a key role in driving evolution of alternative mating behaviors and male morphologies. Um, particular phenotypes, depending on their fitness, will um, be dependent on other individual phenotypes within that population. So game theory looks at alternative strategies where the outcome will be dependent on each individual strategy as well as other individuals. So here we have three side blotched li lizards, one with a blue throat, one with an orange throat, and one with a yellow throat. The different colors are associated with specific strategies for obtaining mates. Our orange throat male is the most aggressive and is going to take care, um, do the best job at defending in large territories. The blue throat is going to do a better job at defending small territories. The yellow throats are non-territorial. They are like females or they mimic females and they are going to use more sneaky strategies to mate. Um, so if you think about the game rock, paper, scissors, depending on which strategy you choose, some strategies are going to win out against others and they're going to be outcompeted by others. It really will depend on all of the strategies and the relative frequency that they are present. Um, so this too is going to be um, seen again, like what we saw in natural selection, frequency dependent selection. Animal behavior is governed not just by genetic factors, but also by environmental factors. Some selfless behaviors can be um, just understood by looking at inclusive fitness. So there's a master regulatory gene that tends to control many behaviors. Um, there is one gene that is able to control the male fruit fly courtship rituals behaviors. And then there can be multiple independent genes that will contribute to one behavior. Um, with green lace wings, there's a courtship song that's unique. Multiple genes will cover, um, govern different components of that particular song. Um, you can have differences at one loci, loci that will have um, big impacts on behavior. Um, male prairie voles will pair bond with their mates, but while, um, but sorry, but male meadow voles do not. Um, there is a neurotransmitter that is present, and the level of that determines which behavioral pattern is observed. So when behavioral variation um, is able, or within one particular species, corresponds to changes in their environment, um, that might be a sign of evolution um, in the past. Here we have western garter snakes. Um, the coastal populations feed on banana slugs, the, while the inland populations don't eat banana slugs, or if they do, it's very rarely. Um, and why we, this is thought to occur, um, they differ in their ability to detect and respond to the odor molecules that the banana slugs are producing. Another one we have, black caps. Um, these are birds that breed in Germany. They actually winter in Africa. Um, but some will stay in Britain, and it's thought that there are different migratory behaviors present between um, these two populations um, that are influenced by genetics. Altruism. Um, natural selection is going to favor behaviors for the most part that are going to maximize that individual's ability to survive and reproduce. Sometimes the behaviors are going to be selfish. Other times, their behaviors are going to be selfless. They may actually not maximize their survival and reproduction ability as an individual, but they will increase the survival and reproduction, the fitness of others in their species. And when this happens, we call it altruism. So in this particular, um, or these examples, the first one, the building's ground squirrel, if it's under threat from a predator, it's going to make an alarm call to let others know. 
even though it knows by making that alarm call, it's more likely to be killed. In naked mole rat populations, if there are individuals that aren't able to reproduce, they are more willing to self-sacrifice um, to protect their reproductive queen as well as their kings from any outside predators. So inclusive fitness explains this idea. And what the idea behind inclusive fitness is, is that the individual is going to have a better chance of proliferating its genes um, by either producing offspring on its own or by helping its close relatives be able to produce those offspring. So Hamilton's rule is when we, in what we call kin selection, was able, he came up with this rule to be able to predict when these altruistic acts would be more likely to be favored among related individuals according to natural selection. Um, variables include the benefit to the recipient, the cost to the altruistic, the coefficient of relatedness, how similar they are genetically speaking. And he said that when natural selection is going to favor altruism, the product of R times B would have to be greater than C. So here's an example where a girl is going to risk her life to save her brother. So there's parent A times parent B, there's sibling one, and then you've got the choice, you've got two possible siblings there, um, half of 50% chance of being having the allele or not. So it says, assume the average individual has two children. Because of the sister's choice, um, the brother can now have two children. The sister has a 25% chance of dying and will not be able to have two children. So 0.25 times two would be 0.5. They share roughly half their genes. Um, so R would be 0.5. So if the brother, if the sister saves her brother, you would take R times B, 0.5 times two, which would be one. And that would be greater than C, 0.5. So kin selection, again, we're going along with this altruism idea. It's going to enhance the reproductive success of your relatives. Um, we saw that with the ground squirrels, that most of the females are closely related to one another. And when alarm calls are given up, they're given up by the females that are trying to help out their close relatives. And the same thing with the naked mole rats. So they want to get those reproductive queen and kings to be able to pass on their generations at their um, personal cost. Reciprocal altruism. So this may occur with unrelated individuals if it is the aided individual can return the favor in the future. So this is going to happen with species that have stable social groups the individuals are able to meet repeatedly. And if you do have a cheater, one that does not reciprocate the altruism, um, they would be punished. So this is what is um, used to explain altruism in unrelated humans. So in game theory, we have this tit for tat strategy that the individuals are going to cooperate when they initially meet. Um, and when you meet again, you're going to treat them the same way you were treated before. Um, unless your opponent cheated, um, which is thought to be um, how possibly reciprocal altruism could have started. So if you engage in this particular strategy, you tend to have a higher fitness than those who are consistently selfish. Um, humans rule the roost when it comes to social learning and cultural transmission. Um, this is related to evolutionary biology through or evolutionary theory through socio sociobiology. Um, our behavior is due to interactions between both our genes and our environment. Um, our social and cultural institutions um, are pretty much um, the one feature where there isn't really a connection between us and other animals.